Tonight, it is our privilege to host Professor Jennifer Holt of UC Santa Barbara, who will deliver a talk on cloud policy. I first encountered Professor Holt's work a few years, and that conference took place shortly after the retrans wars um, that just started up in 2010. If you recall, there was one Academy Awards, it was um, the ones in the March of 2010, where New York City subscribers to Cablevision, which is a big cable company out there, couldn't watch uh, the Academy Awards because of a retrans war between Cablevision and ABC. Um, and there were a lot of those happening at that time. Jen Holt's paper on retrans wars that year was the first analysis of this new breed of warfare being fought over media distribution that I had ever seen that did not come from a business perspective. Because obviously uh, these events have more to do than you know, just affecting corporations. Uh, Professor Holt read the retrans wars drawing on her tremendous research skills and the powerful reserves of historical media theory. And I knew then that Professor Holt's work was special and deeply necessary. Somebody needs to lead the way in investigating media distribution in a scholarly way, and somebody needs to think critically about the numerous changes rocking the media industries today. Um, somebody needs to be the foremost humanity scholar working on topics of media policy and regulation and of media's technical infrastructures and corporate organizational structures. And that person, as I learned several years ago and as you will learn tonight, is Jennifer Holt. Um, in addition to authoring numerous articles for a diverse range of journals and anthologies, Professor Holt is the co-editor of Media Industries, History, Theory, and Method, and a book called Connected Viewing, um, which just came out from Routledge 2014. And she's the author of Empires of Entertainment, which came out from Rutgers in 2011, which examines deregulation and media conglomeration from 1980 to 1996. She's also a director of the Carsey Wolf Center's Media Industries Project and a founding member of the editorial collective for the Media Industries Journal. I knew from the moment that we founded this lecture series that we had to have her take part one day. And I'm so glad tonight that that particular dream of mine is coming true. Please join me in welcoming Professor Holt. That's a nice introduction, thank you. Wow. Um, I want to thank Gail for inviting me. It's really great to be here. I've been a part of the UC system since 1997, and I've never been a Berkeley. So <laughs> shame on me, but I, it's really lovely to be able to be here now. And thanks to um, Megan and Lara for helping with all the logistics of getting me here. It's really exciting. Um, I want to talk today um, about a few things that are all part, part of a book project I'm working on, which is called Cloud Policy. And I'll begin by laying out some of the most relevant trends in digital distribution and connected viewing, which have been a focus of my research for the past few years. I have another book that just came out that I brought for a copy for anyone who grabs it first. Um, it's called Distribution Revolution, and it's interviews with a bunch of different people um, who are either creative artists or studio executives or upstart kind of companies, um, but there's also an introduction that puts things into perspective and um, I think we bring up the telegraph, I'm not sure, we, we kind of take the long view of, you know, um, trends and distribution, but it, it puts things into historical perspective, so that's something I've been working on for a while, and then kind of moving on to issues related to privacy and data security and internet governance, because as I see it, all of these issues are related. Um, and connected. The wires and their governance are um, directly related to our media culture and to the health of our digital citizenry. And I work in a humanities department, but I hang with the, the policy crowd, the policy nerds, and I say that in the most loving way. I aspire to be one of them. I hang with them every chance I get. You know, I'm trying to bridge those worlds and those concerns of lawyers economists, and artists, and media critics with my work, and it has definitely kept things very interesting. I, I just put on a conference last year with my colleague Constance Penley called Dirty Sexy Policy, and we, some of you might have seen it. There's stuff on our website from the panels. We brought together um, people studying obscenity and indecency, including the lawyers who are litigating on behalf of that or defending on behalf of um, people who have been brought up on federal obscenity charges like porn producers and that kind of thing, along with infrastructure, um, people who study infrastructure policy and uh, public advocates. 
So all kinds of people are we brought together and keeping them from, I don't know, tearing each other apart on the stage was a very challenging job as a moderator, but it was really fun. So some of those conversations are available online. Um, okay, so anyway, I'm most in invested and interested in the future of media policy um, as the stakes keep escalating and the power and the control over the pipes and the wires that deliver our media is some of the most awesome power that you can hold today. And it's up to all of us to hold those accountable. So that's what I'm gonna to try to help us do with some of my work. Um, one of the biggest trends in, in this picture has been the disaggregation or the separation of content from traditional distributors. Um, the Netflix website now describes itself as the world's largest internet television network and it's just a matter of time I think before that word internet is, is dropped. Um, the company is also probably as many of you know moving into the movie production business. Um, they're really trying to reinvent themselves as like a new HBO Go kind of company, right? Um, we'll see what happens with that. But it's a, I don't know, they're very beholden to a lot of content companies who are holding them over a barrel to get the rights to that content. So they're starting to do their own, which has been very successful, but we'll see how, we'll see. That's a really interesting place to watch. Um, last year, for the first time ever, Americans watched more movies legally delivered via the internet than um, on physical formats like Blu-ray or DVDs. And really, the physical thing is, is dying. Um, and yet there's more original content uh, production than ever, thanks to the proliferation of platforms and new business models. Um, so the growth of digital distribution has also given birth to the phenomenon of connected viewing, which I've written a lot about. I define it as engaging with um, media in a multi-screen, multi-platform, socially networked digital environment. I'm engaged with the research with Warner Brothers Home Home Entertainment and a research project about it. Um, there's stuff on our website. I'll put that up later. Um, this is our third year moving forward. Last year we had six different research projects in five countries. We had people in Korea, all over the U.S., Brazil, India, and China. The year before we did 11 projects. So there's all kinds of interesting research being done on this topic that isn't always just in traditional academic. Venues. Some, there's some collaboration being done. Um, the landscape of connected viewing is really complicated. It includes things like um, search dynamics and recommendation software to data analytics, second screen initiatives, gaming, remote control applications, as well as other, as well as other types of sharing technologies and metadata suppliers. And I just put some of the companies up there that you might be familiar with. Um, I'm kind of interested in the fact that Twitter bought Bluefin and how that might play out. Um, connected viewing is in many ways um, about the introduction of digital network conversation and cloud storage into the process of media consumption. So right now it's impacting everything in the media industries from business models and narrative development um, to marketing strategies, measurement and metrics, and ultimately our cultural experience of of media. There are some limitations which I'm not going to go into. It's a very chaotic landscape. A lot of the initiatives are work in only one territory and interoperability is uh, not so great just yet. In addition to technological developments, a lot of the inquiries um, or the kind of dynamics animating a lot of the inquiries into connected viewing right now, there's really something for everyone. Will connected viewing play out differently for different media? Obviously, TV has been the TV industry has been a lot more successful than the film industry in engaging um, their audiences online and engaging um, social networking into their uh, publicity apparatus. Um, how how has that worked and why? Um, how will connected viewing transform the narrative of uh, the nature of narrative? And engagement. So now screenwriters are just complaining about this transformation to the six act structure, the dreaded six act structure, as opposed to the three act structure that we've been working in for so long because of online platforms and the insertion of so many more commercial breaks. Right. So now they have to restructure the way they write their stories. Um, the ownership of content. Content companies 
producers are still very invested and most interested in how to stimulate purchase. They're going to hang on to this forever. They, their most valued customer is the one who buys something, buys a DVD or buys even a digital property, right? Um, so the, the digital file. Um, they, they won't let you rent TV on iTunes anymore. They said there wasn't enough demand. I mean, my account alone could have kept them. I could rent all TV every minute, all the time. So they, they're very invested in this ownership proposition. Um, how does ownership become more compelling in this environment? Why do you want a digital file? Why do you want to own it? I thought we were all in, cared, all we cared about now was access, right? I want to have access to it anywhere I am. I don't care about owning it. There's some of us who do, like collector people. Who, how many collector people? There's always a few of you. <laughs> okay. So you're the brains that they're very interested in now. Like, what gets the collector ticking? What turns it on? I mean, they're, you guys are of value to them because you're the last people who care about owning the thing, right? Um, okay, there's also labor questions. Online viewing is often characterized um, an opportunity to expand, expand the brand or extend the brand and it's usually treated as promotional content um, for legal purposes that's coming under fire by creatives. That was the topic, the main topic of the 2008 Writers Guild strike, um, which hinged on that issues. Residuals were reserved for airings on linear television. Um, online exhibition was seen as just the promotion for the real product which takes place and airs on in your living room. Um, how will guilt and labor organizations and creative personnel and management handle these increasingly problematic issues? That's another big topic. Um, and policy. The policy arena is often overlooked, but it's a critical influence on and consideration of how connected viewing will be able to function. So how will the infrastructure of connected viewing um, such as broadband pipes and mobile devices be regulated. In whose vision and to what end? The fact that technology has far outpaced any of the regulatory paradigms designed to police it is really starting to create problems. And the cracks in that facade are beginning to show. In the US, our iPhones are being regulated with um, standards that were written for the telegraph. <coughs> Come on, right? Um, our infrastructure policy right now is, right now, today, is being rewritten and debated. The FCC were having, was having net neutrality hearings today. Did anyone stream them? <laughs> no. Okay. Start to the, you can go back on Twitter today. You can look up um, hashtag net neutrality and read those tweets about the hearings. There were all these nerds in there that I worship. I, I say nerds lovingly. Lovingly. And reverentially. So they were in there telling us what was happening. So that's the place you can go to. Um, and this is good. This is what's going to have the major impact on our, on our digital media culture. So I want to talk a bit today about that infrastructure policy, particularly with respect to the cloud and remote data storage. Um, as media consumption and distribution have increasingly become reliant on the cloud, um, and streaming media platforms are luring more and more audiences away from traditional linear viewing practices and spaces to new models of mobile and digital consumption. Um, it's the cloud space, space really where the future of media will be created and redesigned. I had a, a great offer, I thought, for my students, whoever got the highest grade on the final of my History of Electronic Media course, I was going to give them a television set because I got a new one, I was all excited. It wasn't the nicest flat screen in the world, but it was a television set. And I had to go like 10 people down to give my TV away. No one wanted my TV. I couldn't give a TV away because students don't watch television on the television set. Right? You guys watch. Does anyone in here watch television on a television set? Couple. Couple elderly people. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> right? A, a couple people who, yeah. And, and you're not elderly, you, you just, maybe you're different, you've watched me on a TV set, that's great, I'm so happy. <laughs> you would have taken my, my set if I offered it to you. Um, okay, so the inspired kind of PR-devised imagery of, of the cloud,
conjures up visions of emails and documents and TV shows just kind of residing somewhere celestial and floating in space and readily pulled down to earth as, as soon as we want to access them on demand. The reality of cloud storage is much less ethereal. Um, indeed, the notion of the cloud is a marketing concept that renders the physical, infrastructural realities of remote data storage kind of into a palatable abstraction um, for those who are using it consciously or not. A recent Pew study revealed that 95% of those people who um, think they are not using the cloud actually are, whether in the act of shopping, gaming, online banking, social networks, storing your photos or your music or whatever. There was a great stat in that same survey about cloud imposters too, something like 50% of people are cloud imposters according to them, which means they've lied and they put all these different places where they've lied on a first date, in a job interview, um, in daily conversation about knowing what the cloud is. They pretend they know what it is and they don't. Um, so despite all of this abstract rhetoric and imagery, um, the cloud is of course quite material. Right? It's dependent on a vast series of networks and computer, network computers and servers, usually referred to as server farms or data centers, along with all a host of related software and infrastructure necessary for their operation. Um, and so when we talk about information or streaming media stored in the cloud, we're referring to data that's stored, collected, fragmented, duplicated, and processed often in remote um, locations, even in different countries, often on different servers. And then it's ultimately viewed on an internet connected <laughs> screen of some sort. Um, this means that cloud applications and services send data across international borders uh, multiple times in the process of reaching their audience or their users. You have, you know, whatever, you, well, who's watching something online right now? Not this minute, but in general, <laughs> not this minute, yeah. Oh. Um, what are you watching? We were just talking about uh, Bojack the Horse, actually, yeah. yeah. Is Bojack the Horseman? Horseman, yeah. Bojack, Bojack the Horseman. Horseman. Bojack Horseman, okay. Yeah. It's, Bojack Horseman has probably been to Sweden, maybe to Canada, back down, all over, definitely to North Carolina, all over the place before it gets to you, right? It's really fascinating. I would love to do a little visual mapping of where Bojack Horseman get, goes just to get to you. Um, and as a result, okay, this data, Bojack Horseman, goes through just as many national regimes of privacy laws, intellectual property laws, data protection laws, and other regulation affecting the jurisdiction of and control over that data while it's in the cloud. So this is a widely uncoordinated um, legal maze of transnational data flows and it's created a huge problem for regulators and the courts when determining who has control over that data in the cloud and for how long. Um, the physical component of the cloud has been dispersed all over the world, right, into these data centers. And those data centers have found some legal precedent as um, the legally defined geographic location of data in the cloud. So that's really interesting. Is it existing on my computer? Is it existing in the data centers? Is it existing in the broadband pipes? The data centers seem to be the place that courts have agreed upon for the moment, but whether data is determined to exist in one place, that of a particular server, um, or multiple locations, wherever that data is collected and processed and fragmented and stored, um, usually in a variety of centers, that still remains unresolved. Um, so overall, the jurisdiction and the sovereignty and the governance of this data, particularly that which goes across international borders, is ill-defined and the biggest problem right now for any provider of cloud-based media and information. And I did a bunch of interviews with the, at the FCC about this issue. And the guy who was in charge of international data said, this is our biggest problem. And I said, okay, and, you know, and he's like, we don't have any solutions at this time. <laughs> like, so you're allowed to say, because I got nothing, you know? What are you thinking about? What are potential solutions? And they have, they just have, they don't have any because it would require a different type of how we, different type of um, paradigm for governing the internet, which would be an international one. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, 
Okay, so data centers are the heart of the cloud and its infrastructure. They are the physical presence of this imaginary space. Um, and yet they strive to be invisible in so many ways. Um, they maintain a high degree of secrecy, um, allowing very few visitors from the outside in, and they keep their locations and their operating procedures and any relevant statistics out of the press, largely, um, as a matter of security and market competition. Um, and in fact, their refusal to discuss um, where they're located, how many there, there are, um, other details about how or how much data is processed in these centers has led some in that industry to liken the culture of confidentiality surrounding server firms to the ethos of Fight Club, which is the uh, first rule about data centers is don't talk about the data centers. So I really want to have a conference about data centers in a data center. Yeah. And for me, that's become like the no conference because everyone I ask, they laugh that I would even ask. It's absurd that I would even ask questions. So now I'm like, definitely going to do it. <laughs> and so we'll just see how many more millions of people have to say no. But I'll show you some of the ones I want to have them in. And we'll maybe get on my team, you can help me. Okay. One notable exception to this very protective veil of secrecy occurred with Google's um, 2012 public relations push to promote their data centers and as visible and accessible and most importantly environmentally friendly. Once you start telling everyone how green your business is, that's when you know they're destroying our planet. <laughs> and we'll get to that in a minute. I'm going to return to that. So with headlines having transparency and openness, um, Google released 54 interior and exterior glossy images of their data centers on their website, inviting the public to come inside and see where the internet lives. And these images of technology on the site were devoted to revealing um, shots of kind of like computers and wires and routers and switches. Um, pipes and hard drives, um, they arguably render it much less visible, right, when it's decontextualized. And indeed, it almost in many ways appears as kind of abstract art. Um, and there's no trace of any relationship between these like technological, these technological components and the processing and the storage of the distribution of the trillions of gigabytes, which are now known as zettabytes of data, or the attendant environmental implications. And the structures um, where all of this takes place have also been hyper-stylized to kind of showcase the natural environment and, the seem and seemingly make the, the, the visual argument that this landscape is even more beautiful because of the giant data centers in the picture. So these kind of like, I just love these. Look at the beautiful, it's like National Geographic, right? This is in the Dalles, and there's like nice mist going up over the, oh. <laughs> I, you know, and there's the deer grazing, just oblivious to the hulking mass of steel right there. And I see this all as like infrastructure porn. Really, but in all seriousness, I, I see these images as a very powerful, um, even an artistic statement about infrastructure politics and how they are rendered visible. Right? I mean, look at that. That is cute. Oh my God! Morning in the heartland. This is like Oklahoma. Morning in America. Right? Oh my God! I want to go there. Right? It's a dance center. Oh, we'll get the hang on. Um, okay, so the, the artistic visualization of um, infrastructure is kind of a growing trend. Apple has also put um, its infrastructure, the infrastructure behind its cloud services on display for the digital audience by featuring a host of infographics, um, statistics, and very polished views of its data centers. Um, on its facilities, on its website. There's even a new um, film narrated by Tim Cook uh, that you can access on their website. They also recently got Lisa Jackson, who ran the EPA, to um, head their environmental initiatives. You might have seen a very fluffy piece about Apple's data centers on the Today Show. Did anyone see that recently? I was banging my head against the wall. It was just so um, 
well, you know, we're getting more in depth right this second than they did in their whole five <laughs> piece. Um, also, you, you, Facebook features kind of highly curated photo and news coverage of its global physical infrastructure on very dedicated Facebook pages. Microsoft has started guided video tours of their server farms for free download on their corporate website. Even smaller centers like Bonhoff in Sweden are increasingly on digital exhibit um, with their corporate parents offering various images of server racks, cooling and power technology, and even meeting rooms. Um, this is the coolest one of all, I think, Bonhoff, because it operates in this Cold War civil defense bunker. Hit, this is where I really want to have the... <laughs> uh, and it's hidden 30 meters below the earth, and it's like very dramatic. There's a German diesel submarine engine that they use for backup power just in case, and they love that engine. And this is, I mean, there's no windows. The, that window is like, it's a meeting room that's in the middle of the center. There's no windows down there. Um, and it's just kind of like glowing windowless rock walls that you see. Um, and then there's also, I mean, there's, a, there's coffee table books. There's one called The Art of the Data Center. So this is like a growing kind of way of, there's some news reports, there's some offline documentaries and photographic evidence to, that are putting data centers on display. Um, this one, this one picture I love, this is the CEO of Bonhoff, John Carlong, and he has, I mean, doesn't look it up, and he, that's the WikiLeaks server, and they're very proud of the fact that they are known for their security and for their stance against the man, and they house the WikiLeaks server, and it's super safe because it's 30 meters below the earth, and there's no windows, and a man like him is protecting it. <laughs> so. They have, I, I really like that. So the, the kind of main focus of the, that's another image of the Bonhoeff versus Google, but they're even Google Cycle that's painted to just, you know, invisibly ride through the lengths of pipes. Um, so the, the Google images, it's a lot about the expanse of blue sky and the land around the building. We can look at some of those again. Yeah, and in effect, the data centers are visible, but they're rendered practically inconsequential right, by the spectacle of natural vista and the wide open spaces. Bonhoeff, on the other hand, is literally embedded in the natural environment. Um, there's one more view. Um, and the kind of camouflage of the Swedish data center projects this sense of safety and security by virtue of it's carefully constructed invisibility. Um, in many ways, these representational strategies are um, emblematic of the, of the argument that Lisa Parks makes in her work on antenna trees um, and the politics of infrastructure visibility. Um, and she writes, I quote here, by disguising infrastructure as part of the natural environment, concealment strategies keep citizens naive and uninformed about the network technologies they subsidize each day. I would also add these traditions of concealment and disguise also render data centers and digital media infrastructure generally notoriously difficult to research by applying the toolbox of traditional media industries analysis. Um, we can talk about that more in the, in the Q&A if you'd like. Um, this is a Facebook page devoted to one of their servers and its energy use. Um, while these, where these companies decide to locate their data centers is determined by a, a variety of factors. These include the sophistication of local infrastructure, beneficial tax codes, and crucially, geographical proximity to affordable electricity and other energy resources. I teach a class called The Future of Media, and the first day, our mantra in there is the future of media is air conditioning. Mm -hmm. Okay, all we talk about is air conditioning because we need to power and cool these servers if we're going to have media in the future. Um, electricity costs are key. Data centers are one of the fastest growing consumers of electricity and energy to both power and cool them. Um, one data center can require more power than a medium-sized town. Um, according to a recent Greenpeace report that examined the energy consumption of data centers, estimated that these data centers can waste 90% of the power that they pull off the grid and that their 
carbon footprint will likely surpass that of air travel by the next decade. Um, as a result, there is a really fascinating and growing interdependency and interrelationship between the developing topography <coughs> of cloud infrastructure and energy politics. Google is at the forefront of this complex relationship as the company uses roughly a million servers in what's estimated to be a dozen data centers, dozens of data centers, sorry. Google's becoming also a literal power broker. Um, investing in over, oh, in, they've invested over a billion dollars in clean power projects like solar plants and wind farms in order to buy and sell clean electricity, often to itself, and reduce its carbon footprint. So over time, the goal is to send more clean power into local grids near its data centers, gridding the cloud infrastructure. And in the meantime, they've taken their role as you know infrastructure provider to New Heights, adding literal power to their array of platforms and services and data centers that they offer to keep the cloud functional on their own terms. And Apple is not far behind with its solar and its wind farms. And you can see their little green rating there. Google is gotten the best, and Apple and Facebook are also generating a lot of power. Um, to contend with these, this is not my, this is a Greenpeace infographic. I could never make anything that beautiful. To contend with these significant energy requirements, placing data centers in cool climates has become a common strategy. Um, half of the electricity to run them is for cooling. So Nordic companies have become one burgeoning place for a destination for U.S. companies. Um, if you look at the slide, they're doing a lot better. That's the source of the power, and the gray is coal. China's not doing so well. Um, the, more high, the more sustainable and renewable energy is coming out of the Nordic countries. Um, Facebook has also built an enormous facility in, in Luleå, um, Sweden, and in cooler climates like Iceland and Finland. And Sweden and Switzerland have also attracted more developments. Um, oh, and then the, that's one of the Dallas that's powered by hydro, hydroelectric, hydroelectricity. Um, but the allure of cheaper energy to power these <laughs> data centers often creates huge, it, it often creates jurisdiction shopping, right, for global hosting, which creates all kinds of privacy and security concerns because. The places with the most affordable energy don't necessarily have the best um, appropriate or the best laws to protect data or facilitate the secure exchange of information. Amazon, for example, has servers all over the world. The Netherlands, <coughs> Ireland, Germany, England, Spain, France, Hong Kong, Japan, Korea, Singapore, Brazil, all over. Um, they are the market leader in infrastructure provision. And Amazon Web Services, or AWS as it's often called, they've quietly become a massive utility that includes Gov Cloud, cloud servers for government institutions or government agencies, FinCloud for financial institutions, and it now carries 1% of the internet. The CIA signed a $600 million cloud contract with Amazon and the US Navy and the Fed are also enlisting AWS to take care of some of their cloud-based storage and data needs. So as the public's um, dependence on the private cloud increases and the, data, the stakes for data protection continue to expand well beyond the needs of entertainment companies. I kind of got into this through the entertainment portal and then, holy crap, there's the Navy and the Fed. And I wind up researching all of these other things that I never thought I would be looking at. Um, you know, there needs to, this is requiring support for an internationally focused future oriented framework that addresses some of the policy gaps engendered by the global data center. Um, you know, now that the future of our economic and military stability rests on the security of the cloud space, a space where even new pictures of celebrities are not safe, our priorities and our frameworks for data security have to adapt accordingly. Do you feel safe? I don't. Um, so that, that brings me to kind of the final elements of this landscape I'm trying to lay out here as far as the various dimensions of what might constitute a cloud policy. And those are digital identity and privacy, particularly as they relate to internet governance. Um, 
October is National Cybersecurity Awareness <laughs> Month. <laughs> so happy Cybersecurity Awareness Month. I'm excited to be giving this talk in October. Um, okay, so our, our personal information has become um, an operating currency on social media. And social media networks are really one particularly interesting space where the most vexing issues about digital identity and cloud policy are playing out. Um, so the kind of transformation of social networks into what I view as the new power brokers of the internet, that is um, this kind of growing presence of intermediaries um, known as identity service providers. Have we, have any, have we heard of them? Identity service providers? Okay, well, get psyched because they're going to start ruling your life soon. This is one of the last things I want to address today. Um, identity service providers are basically designed to be digital passports of a sort. They process and they protect data online, um, but they're currently operating without any regulatory parameters at all. And they are outside any type of cloud policy that we might have. Um, many of these are social media platforms like Facebook and Google+. Um, Google's former CEO, Eric Schmidt, recently said, Google Plus is not a social network, which is what maybe we thought it was, it's an identity service. So the fact that social networks are currently being reborn in order to make the digital world a safer place for commerce is something we need to consider in the context of studying these public and private spaces and how they're used and how they're regulated. Um, perhaps the digital public, which is all of us, will be also be activists for social media to be more than private contractors for managing big data about individuals and demand more of these platforms because we are all essentially the architects and the arbiters of their cultural value. And that is not, we should never forget that. Um, the growth of streaming platforms and digital storage lockers and the subsequent access to big data about viewers' personal preferences have run up against our own desires for privacy and security in the digital space. And by our, I mean everybody over 30. I know the rest of you don't care. I know this from my own students. If anyone in this room under 30 is concerned about their privacy in the digital space, can you please raise your hand? <laughs> oh my god! Thank god, this is great! Were you concerned before I started talking today? Yeah. You were? Okay, great. Thank you so much. Spread the gospel to your people, and your friends, and your age group, and your demographic. That's excellent. I'm so happy to be wrong about that. Every time I talk to my students, they just are unconcerned about the consequences of their information, their images circulating. It's not, not a problem. Okay, I'm looking at you guys to keep a, help keep your friends safe. Um, you know, and the cultural anxieties and the protectionist movement around digital privacy in the age of information insecurity have increased dramatically in recent years, um, and particularly of late, right? In no small part, thanks to revelations about NSA blanket surveillance and the prison program and the heart bleed and shell shock, shell shock security bugs, and the instability and the unpredictability of internet policy, um, global internet policy. Um, Okay, so and the international nature of cloud storage, what we were talking about just a minute ago, has only made this landscape more challenging. Um, we can't even agree with our European counterparts on what personal data is or personally identifiable information. We can't even agree on the term. And we can't even agree on what that might be. Um, so the nature of establishing and protecting that has become increasingly complex. Um, central to this is the evolving privacy ecosystem that's fundamental um, to the future of broadband and infrastructure regulation and our, our national regimes of cloud policy. This ecosystem, as I see it, is comprised of a bunch of moving parts. Um, a combination, an intricate combination of citizens' rights, cultural preferences, corporate policies that are both formally stated, like terms of service. Do you guys ever read Facebook terms of service? That's an assignment in one of my classes. My students are like, you can't believe what they're getting up just to be out there, right? Or um, informally practiced, like Comcast and its throttling. Um, state, national, regional, and international regulations and laws. 
stewardship from global entities. Um, this affects all of us and is essentially folded into the layers of um, internet, uh, of infrastructure content and activities taking place across the internet. And whether the fundamental kind of rules of engagement in this ecosystem will be determined by government regulations or by private practices such as those employed by digital content platforms and internet service providers, that remains to be seen. Google's recent assertion that um, those who use Gmail do not, um, you don't, and you no longer have a, a reasonable expectation of privacy. Do we know they said that? Um, that kind of called attention, had, or should have called attention for us to this issue of power and control over private data in the digital space, or what we thought of as private data, and the rapidly evolving character of social networks into pillars of big commerce and governmentally sanctioned internet infrastructure. Um, the attendant developments in this space in the US and the EU are quite a contrast. Um, in Europe, some of these are less pronounced because European cultures actually value privacy for citizens, and they don't refer to all their citizens as consumers. Look how unhappy Angela Merkel is. <laughs> After we got her phone, we should not have done that. Um, there are all kinds of tensions. I'm going to kind of speed up a little bit. There are tensions related to the dual impulses of um, connectivity and protectionism in the EU of late, though, right? Um, they want to establish a connected continent and unite all of the, you know, all of Europe's 28 telecom markets into one. But at the same time, I know Gail is shaking her head. <laughs> That's pipe dream. It is. It is a pipe dream. At the same time, there are um, all kinds of cultural anxieties because of U.S. surveillance, um, and I, you might know about the movements to create national clubs. Um, France, Germany, Switzerland, as well as India, China, Japan, um, and Brazil, and Iran are trying to create a domestic internet. Maybe some of you have heard of the Schengen Club um, in Germany. And these isolationist or protectionist movements are really antithetical to kind of fostering an open internet, and they undermine that um, unified front of connected continent legislation. Uh, the idea of an internet designed to recognize national boundaries is obviously antithetical to how we understand it, but a lot of the recent revelations have uh, made at least thinking about that an understandable thing. Looking at the U.S., I want to talk a little bit about um, this environment where third-party intermediaries, especially those based in the U.S., um, are expanding their control, and that's the world of identity provision. And just to look at it briefly, um, where in Europe they've been addressing privacy concerns through the competing constructs, constructs of a connected continent coexisting with various national clouds. The US is fostering this layer of internet infrastructure using identity service providers, or IDPs. This is in support of the government's view of an identity ecosystem in which IDPs, um, such as Google, serve as middlemen between broadband providers, content providers, government agencies, or consumers, or citizens, as some of us still like to be called. And <laughs> right now, they are extremely powerful, and they are unregulated players in telecommunications. Um, the Obama administration, the, his NSTIC, the National Strategy for Trusted Identities in Cyberspace, um, they're creating this identity ecosystem in which all government agencies are going to adopt a single standard um, and employ a host of these intermediaries or these identity providers to authenticate. Basically, if you want to use any government service online, which we're all going to have to be very soon, you're going to be using this, um, you're going to be using a, a, a digital identity provider. Those providers are increasingly becoming um, social networks. They are also outside, like CDNs, content delivery networks, if we know what they are, Netflix uses them so that you can have an uninterrupted stream of, what's the show? Uh, Bojack Horseman. Bojack Horseman. <laughs> um, like CDNs, um, 
They are also unregulated. So identity providers, content delivery networks, these are outside the purview of the um, FCC and what I like to think of as invisible intermediaries. And these things are falling through the cracks of our broadband policy and operate with almost no oversight. Um, this is my last slide. So the, these cracks hold many of our digital privacy rights as those in the growing global advocacy movement around the right to be forgotten understand very well. Um, this right was protected by a recent European Court of Justice decision that required Google to allow users to remove any unwanted personal information in the form of a link to a web page from search results. Imagine if that was a right that we had here. Um, this is a new millennium kind of digital version of the very famous Warren and Brandeis um, decision where they talked about the right to be let alone as a part of the right to privacy. And it's, it's a focus of a consumer movement that seeks to instantiate privacy protection precisely by defining it in the negative. Um, and so the, the right to be per, per, forgotten provides the, or promotes the absence of big data related to individuals, um, straddling the kind of competing models of privacy that the content, connected content and the identity ecosystem are representing. It's also very antithetical to how social networks think about themselves and operate, given that these communities are being, about being noticed and being heard and being remembered and seen. And so it's very unlikely that this, this decision will apply outside of Europe. It's not surprising that it originated in Europe's highest court. Um, so this lack of universal legal standards for a global digital ecosystem means that all of us will be participants in establishing the digital future for culture, for information exchange, and for citizenship. And for that reason, I'm arguing anywhere that will invite me that it's time to think and act globally in the policy sphere. And I recognize that there are tremendous challenges involved with internationalizing aspects of broadband regulation, including the differences, cultural differences in what privacy is, or how we define privacy and security. And there's a lack of coordinated efforts at global internet governance, and there's clashing standards, and there's an absence of consensus about technological and even psychological norms, which is something that they talk about um, in the privacy ecosystem. But the stakes are just too high to continue down the current path of gray zones, private control over public information, and market-driven priorities. Um, while economic concerns will obviously influence the trajectory of broadband regulation and cloud policy, um, the vision for the future of this regulation has to be bigger than fears about restricting innovation or hindering free trade. Because there are larger cultural freedoms and issues and rights at stake than simply commercial ones. Adopting a policy framework that casts the viability of a robust, secure, globally interoperable privacy ecosystem as critical to the health of our democracy as well as to global communication, trade, and culture is one of the most important ways to safeguard its survival. And you know, lastly, I think it's really significant that the current digital distribution revolution and the applicable regulatory frameworks are largely being dictated according to terms set by corporate gatekeepers of content as opposed to government policymakers. It's up to a vigilant public to ensure that their interests, our interests, are part of this equation. And I, I really hope to create some kind of dialogue with this work that allows more people into the debate and engages us all to be a part of these critical conversations about the complex politics of media technology. Um, there's an email if you want to talk more. There's a website where there's all kinds of good resources. And we can also tweet at each other. Um, so we, I don't know if we have time for Q&A, but thank you very much for your time and attention. Ah, oh, I didn't know your Twitter handle. No, oh, I wasn't am. using it while I was live tweeting this whole event. Uh, we do have time for questions, so um, please ask questions. Thank you so okay. much for your uh, very interesting talk. I'm just wondering, uh, you uh, brought in a bunch of different aspects of data centers and their ramifications for uh, practical issues. I can understand when it comes to environmental sort of concerns, we can focus 
on the data center. But at the same time, I have this impression, and I'm kind of thinking as well, I just want to have your take on this. When it comes to privacy, when it comes to areas of culture, focusing on the data centers and the physicality elements, which is like the infrastructure of the whole yeah. cybersphere, is kind of undermining your own concern of a more, um, you know, a broader reach for your privacy. Because we have kind of entered the whole discourse which these gatekeepers have kind of set forth. You are accepting their own presuppositions. You are, you are kind of accepting that whoever has the data has kind of control over the data. It, it seems like you want to talk about access to education and only focus on access to school, access to blackboards, access to jobs. This is one of the reasons that when it comes to like freedom of speech, we say ir irrespective of the medium, you have such and such entitlement. Yeah. So I just don't know how much you see focusing on the data centers and the physicality and you know the physical infrastructure behind the net is kind of undermining the sort of values that you want to promote, such as you know more right to privacy. Yeah, I like that idea a lot. I. I mean, the reason why I focus on the data centers is, you know, in many ways, they are the physical um, location of the cloud, in many ways, other than our computers. And I, a lot of the, my own methodology for doing research is by following case law and looking to the ways in which these things are litigated and protected legally. So I guess I could kind of abandon that mindset and think more radically, which I think is what you're urging. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm a lawyer, unfortunately. You are? Oh. <laughs> so, and you want me to abandon No, the I'm saying that the whole discourse which is being shaped by lawyers yes. is serving the interests that we want to kind of oppose. So looking at that discourse, is kind of entering into a room which has been preset for you. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I just feel that um, we are talking about privacy as an entitlement which you have no matter where your data is. It is something that gives you some form of immunity from public intrusion no matter which country is dealing with those data. Whereas for those lawyers and corporate interests, they feel focusing on the data centers give them some form of legitimacy because now you are abide by their terms of service and the contract. We are giving you free email so you can share your data with somebody else. But the whole discourse is kind of misconceived or is kind of being driven in a way that kind of, uh, you know, promotes yeah. their interests. I appreciate these comments a lot because I feel like that, you know, with the book, as with my last book, I. It's like either you're going to put your politics all the way out there, or my last book I kind of didn't, and I I laid out the roadmap, and then it was like you you guys use it however you want to use it, but I was not very overt with any kind of like Marxist politics or anything like that, and so your question is making me think about how political I would like to be because I'm kind of approaching this in the same way as laying out the legal map for how to understand what's happening, but. Um, yeah, it could be a lot more politicized and it could be looked at even on, as more of a discursive analysis. There's all kinds of ways I could get more political about it and now I'm going to think about that as I go back to the very tiny manuscript. But uh, I'm glad we had this moment at this time with the writing because now I can think about it. Thank you. What's your name? Reza. Reza. Thank you. Um, on the issue of privacy and kind of, in some ways, discouraging um, these you know, these big uh, identity providers um, from retaining personal information, one, do you think that the the way for the individual to kind of circumvent this, because I think it is very on a huge political like stage that we don't actually have direct influence over, do you think the the kind of way to circumvent that is like peer-to-peer -peer or Tor browsing kind of thing, like where it's circumventing this traditional um, web 
infrastructure? Uh, and then two, do you see that being maybe one of the first things to go if uh, net neutrality doesn't get preserved and uh, these kind of, these um, linkage centers like you know Comcast, AT&T, all of these connectivity uh, companies have like the right to throttle un, you know, um, uncontrollably in some ways uh, the internet. Do you think that they, that is one of the first things that they'll shut? Just what I want you all to understand is we don't have net neutrality right now. There's, there is none. So we think we do, but we don't. The only reason why, you know, it's not one big throttling orgy out there is because there's <laughs> been kind of like a mild gentleman's agreement to behave. But they aren't really behaving. They're mildly, minimally behaving. So there is a lot. I mean, that's why what the hearings were today. If any of you go online tonight and look up those hearings and read about them on Twitter, I'm going to be so psyched. OK? So when you go back and look at all that, you'll see they're still debating about how to insert net neutrality. Is it going to be, you know, and what you'll see a lot of times is Title II, Title II, Title II. Title, the whole thing is about the night, not to really get too wonky, but the 96 Telecommunications Act, before you know, we really had the internet cruising as we do now, um, I guess it was cruising, but it was like a toddler. The, they decided, will broadband be regulated like telecommunications? And what they decided, there's Either you're going to regulate something under Title I or Title II. Telecommunications is Title II. Okay? And that is what is afforded common carrier protections. So what is common carrier? Common carrier is something that's so important to the health of a functioning society that we can't mess with it at all. So we've got to have telephones, ports, Railways, these things are common carriers, and they can't be. They can't, there can be no discrimination. So Barack Obama's telephone call is sent. It's about the sender, not the receiver. Is sent at the same speed as your phone call and my phone call, because it's under common carriage. If broadband is not given Title II protections, it's not going to have that common carrier protection where someone can't send something faster by paying more. So for a while, they kind of threw up their hands and they said, oh, it's not, and they, they wanted to rewrite it and say, oh, we're going to put broadband under Title II. Um, and they said, oh, that'll never happen. And then there was this like, weird moment like a month ago where they were like, oh, maybe it will happen. And I was, did you see all this? I was so excited, I couldn't even breathe. And now they're like, oh, it's never going to happen. <laughs> so we don't know where that's going to wind up. Um, but I'm more concerned, I mean, of course I'm concerned about my Netflix, because that's really all I care about. But more than that, I'm concerned about the future of our democracy, right? And the future of the free flow of information. I mean, look at what, we can look at anything. We can look at the Arab Spring, we can look at Hong Kong, what's happening now, we can look about all of these moments that depend on the free flow of information. How would we know what's even happening? I mean. So the news reporting certainly sucks, right? But we get it direct from, if we still can, people in Hong Kong who are getting their message out. But it's through the internet. And that's what we need to hold people, hold power accountable. So that's really the stakes. I mean, I kind of like float in there by talking about entertainment. And then we like get busy with other things, right? So, I don't know, does that answer your question? Oh, and then the best way. Were you asking me the best way to kind of go with this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. Um, about trying to protect one's self in any kind of, like, is it to just go NLS? By connecting, like, via any third party, you are giving away pretty much all right to privacy in that sense. Yeah. I know. I mean, I would love you kind of civic-minded students to invent some awesome platform that allows us to conduct our business in a safe and secure way that doesn't make us surrender every, you know, our firstborn and everything else that comes with it. So, I don't know. I mean, maybe it, I don't know how to be 
be the best, you know, yeah. dissident of all, in, in the face of all of these rules. I just pirate it, so, yeah. <laughs> um, so, we, uh, first of all, thank you for giving this talk. That was Thanks for coming. Fascinating. Um, and uh, we were just talking about common carrier protection in Title II and giving everything equal protection. And I'm just wondering how much uh, has efficiency and like the perspective of people who you know are striving for like properly coded and proper technology in these fields uh, versus like the policy makers. Like I would argue we can enjoy our Netflix because we don't have common carrier policy. Like if we're considering. Um, you know, packet as like a piece of information sent over the web. Um, you know, with common carrier, that packet with any uh, different carrier has equal weight. Um, but certain web services perhaps shouldn't have equal weight. Like an e a weight, like an email service, doesn't need to have a packet sent like uh, as fast as a web streaming service. If a packet what is the most important email in the entire world. Well, I don't know. But I mean, uh, I mean even still, judge. even still, like a one millisecond delay on an email packet will not be noticeable to a user, even if it is the most important email in the world. But a one millisecond delay on a packet from Netflix will cause the video to stutter and cause many things to go awry, and that is something that's very noticeable to the end. He's user. he's trying to hit you in your Netflix. Jen. Yeah. No, <laughs> it's not going to work because <laughs> because. What I don't want is any go is any government deciding what category of data is more important, and then they're going to go into looking at that content and saying, "Oh, well, this um, is subversive, and this really doesn't need to fast lane. We should actually slow this shit down, right? We do not need this to spread with efficiency." So there's that issue, and then there's also the issue of well, if Everything should be so much faster than it is. Like that's the part of the argument I didn't get into. Look at we're what are we now? Like eleventh on the list of developed countries, eleventh um, in speed. We're we're it's I mean it's embarrassing how poor and pathetic our services are. So everything should be so much faster, and it should. It should not be up to any, um, I don't know, I don't want the government deciding what kind of content that, that, oh my God, deserves to be faster or slower. That is end of day's conversation for me. But thank you for the question. Yes? Why are we slower than the other 10 countries that are going on? Well, most utilities are monopolies. Right, and they are not state-run monopolies, which have its own major, major problems. I'm not advocating for that, but there's no competition. So as much as I hate, I, don't, I have Cox cable. What do you guys have? Uh, Sonic. Sonic. It's the only ISP that EFF recommends. Okay. So I don't it's a repackager, though. Right. Yeah. So it's on top of AT&T. Yeah. Okay. AT&T. Whatever these companies are, they, it goes back to how cable. Um, franchises were given out in the 80s. They said, we don't want 15 companies digging up the sidewalks, right? I mean, think of it, and we can go back to the telephone too and the telegraph. It all, for me, it starts, it all goes back to the telegraph. We can always bring it back around. But I won't. Um, <laughs> we'll just we'll go back to the cable, cable in the 80s. They didn't want 15 companies digging up their sidewalks and their um, streets. So they granted monopoly franchises to one company. That, therefore, they have no incentive to end and it. Obviously, what happened naturally after that prices went through the roof, service went into the toilet. So there's absolutely no incentive to provide you with better service, to invest their earnings into better service, or to give you better um, treatment because there's no competition. So that's really the answer. Um, and we're always kind of, we're, we're usually behind in these kind of things. We really are. I hate to say it. Yeah. Uh, no. I mean, I didn't really have a question, but wouldn't like increasing, I don't know, more internet speed, or like at least getting, 
uh, more of what you're talking about possibly endanger the like privacy rights? Like, I, I don't see where those two oh. reconcile. Kind of. I don't know. I haven't thought about that about the speed with which insecure data can be transmitted and how that might affect. I think it's more about the way we understand how these wires are treated, whether they're, you know, regardless of speed. But that's an interesting thing to think about. And another point that I'll bring up to your question is, now most of the advances, especially in speed, are being delivered by private companies like Google, um, who are tech companies and not traditional infrastructure companies, but they're the ones who are hopefully going to be afforded the same considerations and maybe we'll have more choice. Yeah. What about this idea of a public identity provider? I noticed when you were talking about this, you were just using Facebook and Google, but there's like nascent efforts to try yes. and make something that is non-corporate there. Like, what do you see for that? Do you see it having to be a corporate thing? Well, it's like if the government's going to work with them, they're going to do a corporate thing. I mean, I don't think fundamentally it has to be a corporate thing, no. But if, you're, if the government's going to contract with them, the government is just notoriously conservative um, entity that isn't willing to take chances but on... arguably that this U.S. government already has an identity service for U.S. citizens, multiple even. It could either be tax records, it could be voting records, whatever. It has our identity in some form already. Yes, but they are not the. Co they don't want to be the company that has to manage all of that digitally. So they're going to farm it out. And interestingly, the post office plays a really interesting part in all of this. Um, they're like the walking undead. I love the post office. I really do. It's like I'm still amazed. I can't believe it that any letter ever arrives anywhere. I just, I'm always very impressed with the post office, that what they do. But they're, you know, the physical thing, again, is dying and we're really, they're, they've got not, they, they've got a lot less work to do than they used to. So now they are moving into this space, which is really fascinating. So that's kind of the one space that it might not be a corporation, but it might be a government entity, okay. the role right. of the post office. And that is fascinating, but we'll see. Yeah. I'm starting to realize how, like, how could even it be created anything to be completely private? You know, like you were saying, like, oh, you can create a platform that's completely. But if there's a server, then the what the company isn't work. allowed to look in. What is the company isn't allowed to access to that data? Maybe. Thank you. <laughs> really, just very worried. Yeah. Um, when you see these, like, they're still third party companies, but they're like fourth party company almost, in that they're like, they're not the direct, directly connecting you to a service, nor are they the service that you are using, but they still collect, you know, millions of data points on every user and then sell those as, you know, data packages. Um, where do you like Rovio or yeah uh -huh. yeah um, and these you know companies that like you may have never you know, had contact with but they have like up to you know twenty five to whatever how many thousand like points of data on uh -huh. you because of they're collecting cookies and building these giant you know profiles um, where do you see like it's it's so hard to say like. How, in what ways, with uh, legal, like, because you talked about meeting up with uh, lawyers a lot, but how are they legal? That's what I want to know. How is that even legal? Because it's it seems absurd that, like, so, someone that you're not even directly coming in contact with is allowed to not only keep personal information on you, but sell it as well. Yeah, I mean, I often tell my students, and they don't really, I think they think I'm just, I don't know, board or analogies, but I always tell them this is really the wild, wild west, right? Days of the internet. And if we are, you guys are going to be like in a rocking chair with your false teeth someday, and you'll be like, I remember the days when, you know, I could send an email and it just went off before whatever, right? You can imagine all the complications that are going to be happening, or when you had to use a computer to send it instead of pushing a button on your temple or whatever. So I think it's a great question.
question, how is this legal? There's a lot that hasn't been established as protocol outside the goals, outside those goals that I was talking about that are completely outside of the neoliberal framework, right? So what is best and most efficient for the market? And there are so many other values that need to be preserved and protected, but that's our voices. And that's your representatives' voices. And that's who we need to urge to protect those values. But yeah, in the, in the corporate space of creating the landscape and the rules of engagement, why not? It sounds like a great idea. Right. I don't have to collect the data. I don't have to do anything. I just, you know, take a percentage or let them take a percentage of my money and I have all this amazing information. Or I'm making a ton more money. So that, it's, it's legal because we haven't urged our leaders to make sure it's not. Yeah. So get on that. <laughs> Last question. Uh, okay. Right. When this Rosanet Cloud thing first came up, I thought, well, this isn't too new because way back I got my first email account with Yahoo, uh, which is a webmail where they keep the, the data themselves uh, uh, in, their, in their server and so on. But anyhow, uh, the other thing I wanted to know is how profitable is this cloud computing business for these companies that are getting into it? And are we going to eventually have a shakeout where there's maybe two or three companies that have uh, all the business? Or how do you see this? Yeah, I mean, Amazon is by is far and away the leader. They have everybody's cloud, including their competitors. They house Netflix's cloud. I mean, they're direct competitors, and they just have such a vastly better infrastructure built out at this point. So I think that's a great question. I, I think you're right that it will likely turn into that. And that's why I call attention to how strange it is that none of these providers are regulated or within the FCC's purview. It's very problematic um, that these are unregulated spaces. And I think, I think what, what you're bringing up is a very likely scenario. As far as how profitable is it, that's a good thing and a very good question, a very difficult one to answer. You know, they, I've read measure, there are various measures of the cloud is what, a, you know, $60 billion business or something, but I don't really know what that means. Um, so it's hard to measure the impact on, um, I don't know, efficiency or productivity or anything like that. So I think that, uh, that's a statistic I will obviously have to find different ways to address for the book. So thanks for reminding me of that one too. Thanks so much. For